Welcome, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, you can hear me. Okay. All right. Um, does everybody have, everybody has a book, right? They're acting up already. You can tell the college writing faculty in the room. Um, um, we are here today to introduce you to our customized textbook. Basically, it's our handbook for the college writing program. Um, you'll notice on the front of it that it says AU, which looks different than the one that's up there on the slide. It's the same book, but the first uh, 38 pages um, are customized just to AU. So we want to share that book with you today and talk about how we can make your job easier because we all at some point teach writing. So we want to help you have the skills to do it uh, better perhaps, um, but also more, definitely more efficiently because I think we're probably all working a little bit too hard reinventing the wheel. And instead what we'd like to do is show you the wheel um, and then convince you that um, this will help you in your own classrooms. So I want to make sure you're in the right session. Um, I want you to think about a paper that you graded last semester and whether or not you found any errors, student writing errors. And if you did, raise your hand. Any at all. Any would work. Any. If you found any student errors, uh, writing errors for any of your papers last semester. Okay, then I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them what you found to be the most common error in student writing in your papers last semester. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, there's more over here. Thank you, Angel. Commas. 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 Yeah. Yeah. No. Semi. Yeah. You're right. Ooh. Don't use them. You're right. Don't use them. Yeah. Like a lot. Yeah. I would say yes, except um, yeah. Actually, I'll go with that. Commas. We agreed on commas. 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 Yeah. Commas. 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 Okay, you're still talking. <laughs> if you can hear my voice. <laughs> no. Oh, there's some more books back there. Okay, I can still hear you talking, so you must still have errors, a lot of them. They're still talking. They're like, wait. I don't think this is broadcasting. No. Probably just going to the Probably just going to the camera. Okay, let me have your attention back up here, real quick. I don't think they can hear me. All right, we're going to refocus. <laughs> You're still talking, which means there's a lot of errors in your student writing, right? <laughs> um, so we want to share the book with you and talk our way through how we teach. Uh, writing in the college writing program and share share the resources basically that we've helped develop. Um, I want to introduce everybody who's up here who we're all college writing um, faculty. This is Mike Cabot. I'm Melissa Scholes Young. This is Stina Oaks, Allison Thomas, and Angela Dadak. And they're all going to share with you particular things that they have found to be very helpful as we have started using this book. Um, this is our first semester. This will be beginning our second semester using the Easy Writer, but we've had a common handbook in the college writing program, but this is the first time we've actually uh, written it so that it's specific to our program. You can't hear me at all? Well, that's interesting. I think it records. It's just recording it for the camera. Okay. So I'll just talk louder, Janet. How's that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, as I said, this is the handbook that we've been using. It's new to us that it's customized, but we're using it for our second semester, and we've had a lot of success with it so far. So I'm hoping by this point you'll see freshmen. All of the freshmen have the book. Um, they're required if they go through the college writing program to buy the book, um, so we're hoping that uh, it will become contagious, and by the end of their four years, everyone on campus will be using a customized book, and we'll all have a, have a common vocabulary, so that because we all teach writing, we're all then using writing vocabulary that our students um, are familiar with, right? So all, all the freshmen who have been through the college writing program have this book. Which is now all of them. Which is now all of them. them. <laughs> which is now all of them. All yes. of them are in, do go through college writing then at the beginning? Not every student goes through it in the fall. Some students uh, would go through a 106 or a 132, but the majority of our AU freshmen are taking a 100 in the fall and a 101 in the spring. Um, which are collaborative courses, and they will all have this book. Yes. They, they may tell you they don't, but they're lying. <laughs> <laughs> they have the book. They just have to maybe get it out of their backpacks, find it in their dorm rooms. 
they have the book. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, so the first thing that we want to show you, um, and, and I think this is probably the question that bothers us the most about this common text, is that it's called Easy Writer. Um, and we hate that title. We really do, but we can't seem to change it. And we love everything else about the book. Um, but it, it, for me, maybe uh, suggests to the students that writing can be easy. It can be quick. It can be, um, in a fast-paced world, something that's done um, through an app. And it, it really can't be. Writing takes a lot of time. Um, and so we don't think writing's easy either. So you can ignore the title and just call it the College Writing Program's Customized Handbook. It's a little bit longer. Not quite as catchy, but uh, one of the resources in the book that we like most, um, and, and I'm going to actually ask you to open up the book and find the section called Top 20 Student Writing Errors. It's, I'll, I'll give you another little hint. It might be called Find It, Fix It. Oh, and Allison's using her uh, the table of contents. <laughs> That's a skill, Allison, that we teach in college writing. <laughs> it's actually on page one. It's past all of the customized section in the beginning. That's the white and gray part. So if you skip to the green part, page one, it's find it, fix it. And this is the very first activity that I do with my students in, in college writing because it integrates and shows them all of the sources that I want them to use in college writing. So this is the handbook um, and then we do a diagnostic test to find out whether or not the, they actually have any writing problems at all because they all come in pretty confident with their writing and then as we take it apart and we find out that the way that you write for college sometimes is a different audience that we expect you to amp up that skill. And so um, the first thing I do is the top 20 student writing errors, and there's an online component where they can take a test, find out which errors they're missing, and then more importantly than just finding out that they have errors, figure out how to fix them. Because I think there's a big difference between us with our red pens correcting everything for them and teaching them actually how to find an error themselves and, and correct it so that that becomes a skill that translates into their other class. Right? Um, so the companion website, we click on that, mm -hmm. that goes along with the Easy Writer um, is completely free, open to our students, um, open to you even, and I um, actually have a sign-up sheet that I'll send around if you want me to send you the links to this URL also. Um, everything that's up here are under the free and open resources are things that you can use in your own classroom that we use in the college writing program and it's meant to be a companion to the book so it's an extension of the book um, and the top 20 errors are the first thing the videos are fun too uh, if you want to see the writer actually uh, talk about college writing in the real world um, so this goes through diagnostically what are the top 20 things and many of them are probably things that you just mentioned to your neighbor that you find in, in student papers also as errors. So this actually shows them, now that I know I don't know how to use uh, commas, how I actually fix that in my own writing. Um, so this is useful. And then what I do is have them use exercises in the, will you go back? That's okay. I want you to go back to the PowerPoint real quick. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, just, there's, a, there's another link to uh, the extra, the exercises. And in my, in my class, I have them set up an account. They do these exercises, and then the exercises come directly to, um, they're actually held on this website. But they send them basically to my email address. You have to put in an email address. So students can do these exercises on their own, and it comes to a separate grade book that's actually held on this website for me. So there's a whole process of introducing what is the error, how do you fix it, now let me test you on how you fix it, now do this exercise, and then I want to actually see it in their own writing. Um, but I like the companion part of this, of this handbook. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the ways that I find it very useful. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Allison next to talk about how you might use this uh, and integrate the source if you're doing research at all in your classroom. Thanks. Uh, so as Melissa mentioned, this first part of the, of the book is customized to AU. Um, it's just the first 20-ish pages in here. Um, and as Melissa also mentioned, uh, 
teaching students uh, in the writing classroom involves more than just fixing something, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that in the, in the college writing program, we're not only trying to think about errors per se, um, we're also thinking about things like how can we teach students how to craft meaningful arguments? How can we help students make choices about organization? How can we help them uh, think about things like style? Uh, and how can we help them navigate the waters of research? Um, and so. The writing program works, our faculty works with uh, the library. Uh, we partner with librarians in all of our classes, um, and students learn uh, information literacy skills. Um, and this can be really overwhelming for a student. Uh, first time at AU, first time in this particular library, but also first time with this kind of language. Information literacy is a term that we use in our classrooms uh, that the library certainly uses. Um, and it means a lot of things. It, it not only means the sort of mechanical skills of finding a source through a database, say, or finding a book and grabbing it off the shelf, but it also involves a sort of conceptual understanding of when do I figure out what I need here? How do I figure out what kind of information I need? How do I get it? And then what do I do with it when I find it? Um, and so those are all complex things that happen with research and college writing, but obviously they happen in your classes too across the university. Almost every class in the university involves some kind of research component, whether you're teaching it or you're requiring it in a particular assignment. Um, and so this section can be really helpful. It starts on page AU19. Um, and what happened was uh, when we put together this section, uh, our faculty, some of our faculty met with a few librarians and we put together uh, a list of our sort of values about uh, teaching research and information literacy. And we summarized those here in the first uh, page or so um, where we talk about why research matters, what information literacy is, and what some of the things uh, students will experience in learning about research here at AU. I feel like this is an important uh, resource for anyone who's involving research in their classroom because like Melissa said, language actually becomes an issue. Research shows that students are better able to transfer what they're learning in one class to another class if the vocabulary is consistent. Um, and so looking at these kind of values can allow you to move some of this language into the work that you're doing in your classes and again, help you not reinvent the wheel when you're talking about research. Build on the foundational skills that students have when they get to you. I feel like many of the students that I send away uh, are probably going to be okay in terms of high level research skills. However, if the same language isn't being used or if the same skills aren't being sort of directly built upon, they will struggle. Um, but that doesn't mean they can't do research. It just means that they need a little bit more help kind of putting all of this complex picture sort of together. Um, so the next section here is uh, you'll see a kind of map of different library pages. Um, so we took apart the library's website, we identified particular areas on the website that we highlight in our classes, but certainly can be used as a reminder to them once they leave us or as an introduction to an assignment in another class. So you can point them to these pages to say, you know, your assignment requires research. If you've forgotten some of those research skills you built up in college writing, take a look at these pages. Um, one thing that's a little different that I'll actually make note of here is the reference to the library's information literacy tutorial, um, which appears on page 24. Points out number two, that's actually in a slightly different location. We're reprint reprinting this book for next year and it'll have the correct location. But if you haven't seen the library's information literacy tutorial, it's worth looking at, putting on your syllabus or putting on an assignment. Um, it uh, looks like a subject guide on the library and leads students through some key skills for navigating the library's resources. Um, so these are references you can point students to that won't be unfamiliar to them. In fact, it harkens back to what they've spent really a whole semester becoming familiar with. Um, and so hopefully that's something that um, can be useful for any research assignments that you have. Um, so I would recommend thinking about this section as something that can be recommended to students before they begin an assignment uh, or can be included on a syllabus or on an assignment sheet to sort of remind them that they know some of these things already or that they should be using some of these skills that they've already um, collected. Um, and that we as a faculty can kind of get on the same page 
uh, vocabulary wise uh, and save each other some some time by by building from what's already there rather than feeling like oh I need students to learn how to research and also produce this content in my class when uh, those skills might already be there Good. awesome so um, I'm gonna go ahead and talk can you hear me on that yes. okay awesome I'm gonna go ahead and Wait, talk oh yeah so link to Allison I love chapter 38 in the mm -hmm. book that links to research because it has that common vocabulary about popular sources, scholarly sources. Yeah, Mike's going in. into it. <laughs> oh, well, no, I'm actually going 39. So, okay. so this, this is a good bridge then. Yeah, yeah. My favorite chapters. Good. So that actually bridges well. Um, uh, because uh, what Alice was talking about is obviously using the library sources to find the sources, primarily. And then the question is, of course, well, what do the students do once they have the sources? And so, um, you know, I'm pretty sure that I know some of the, the assumptions that I make when students uh, do not effectively incorporate those sources into their writing. They're probably similar to some of the ones you make. Um, I'm actually echoing an article that I really like that I know some of my colleagues really like from Kyle Stedman. Um, it's called Annoying Ways People Use Sources. Um, it's on writingspaces.org. Um, it's, it's another just great resource that a lot of us are trying to use. Um, but the assumptions that we make when they don't incorporate sources correctly are usually either that they don't know the ways and the conventions of, of incorporating sources into the work, or they don't care, right? That's kind of what we guess, right? Um, what I hope is maybe becoming evident is that we have a text here that provides you with a way to show students that you know, that they know, uh, these conventions, right? Or that they should at least, right? That they have been presented to them before. Um, these are really provides students with tips and guidelines for reading, evaluating, and using sources effectively. Uh, one of the primary sections for this is chapter 39. Um, it's about 184 in, in the text here. Um, in chapter 39A, uh, there's a section of specific guidelines for evaluating the usefulness, the credibility of sources. Um, I really like using this uh, in several different ways in the classroom. Um, when I think about some of the annoying things that I come across uh, with research papers, um, I think about you know um, some of the poor online sources that get incorporated sometimes. Uh, for instance, uh, I had a student writing about a, a, a GMOs, genetically modified organisms, or GMO crops. Um, and they had something from about.com, or they had something from factmonster.com, or something like that, right? We're probably familiar with these, right? Um, so something like this, uh, questions that ask them to evaluate their sources is really valuable. Um, um, there's also, I've had papers where someone was writing about the current global economic crisis, and they cited something from 1986, right, mm -hmm. to talk about the current one. Not with a historical perspective that could be very useful, but kind of like, here's what's going on now, and here's what someone says. So, uh, trust me, we've all experienced this too um, in our own classes. Uh, so chapter 39, uh, ask them to look at the usefulness, the timeliness, the credibility of the sources. Um, it asks students to also evaluate their own purpose. What are they writing for? Who are they writing for in terms of audience? Um, and consider the relevance, the credentials, the timeliness um, of those sources. It also pushes them to look at things like accuracy, potential bias in the sources. It questions, therefore, author and publication and where this is coming from. And it also asks them to cross-reference, to say, hey, you should be reading more than just this article, this source, this book. You should be asking questions of, does this seem to match everything else that I'm reading? So it has a section that really does that nicely. I've actually used that uh, 39A directly in a class to look at sample websites that um, you know, are sometimes a range of very credible, and, and you could definitely use it in an academic paper, to those that are less credible, to even those that are joke websites that are fakes, that aren't actually legitimate information, and have them sit down in class and use these exact questions and say, hey, would I use this in paper or not? And if I would use it, how would I use it? Or what could I use it for? right, in terms of purpose. Um, and, and so that, that's been a very good exercise. And again, uh, you know, you can, if you have the knowledge of this, that they have this, and you have this in front of them, or they have it in their backpack, or they have it back in their dorm room, you know, it's, it's something that you can actually hold, hold them accountable for at some level. Um, there are some other good tips here. Uh, 39D uh, talks about um, paraphrasing and, and uh, using sources correctly in terms of quotation, uh, summary, paraphrasing. Um, it it uh, 
Actually, 39D has several excellent examples of unacceptable forms of uh, paraphrasing, including things like straying from the author's ideas and not really capturing what they were actually saying, uh, using the author's words or sentence structures too closely so that they're really quoting, but they're trying to write it off as a paraphrase, paraphrase that it's in their own words. Um, it also then gives a really good example of an acceptable form of, of paraphrasing. Yeah. Um, Let me yeah. add, yeah. Mike, also that this, this part I used with the online companion last semester for the mm -hmm. first time, and there are five different exercises where they give right. the student a text and the right. student has to practice paraphrasing the text, and then they submit it to me. And when they came into my online gradebook, I realized mm -hmm. I want them to bring that to class now. They right. did this great exercise. They understood what they were doing um, incorrectly in the paraphrase. That really was plagiarism. But I then needed them to bring it in the classroom so we could rewrite it so I could actually use that, that um, exercise in the classroom as a teaching tool, not just as a diagnostic tool. Right. Mm -hmm. um, there's also some guides I, I have on the, on the slide here. There's tips for critical reading on even in Chapter 3A, so another part of the book, that gives questions about purpose and audience and author and, and uh, has them think about things, those things as they're reading and as they start taking notes um, as well. Um, so this... And we, this kind of touched upon this then, what Melissa was saying uh, touched upon this. This text can also then serve as a really viable resource for talking about plagiarism and for talking about um, various types of plagiarism and the issues that are involved there. Um, it does provide writers with tips on integrating quotes. Um, that includes using things like signal phrases, how they introduce who's speaking. Uh, it talks about the importance of accuracy when quoting and also shows students how to use brackets, ellipses, to kind of take things out or change things. Um, and it also emphasizes things like, you know, the quotes need to make grammatical sense within the sentence that you incorporate them into. Um, it has some guidelines on uh, incorporating visuals. If you have them working with a lot of visuals, graphs, pictures, other images, uh, charts, um, it talks about how they can label those, how they can make reference to those labels in the text, how that needs to be kind of cited and, and set up. Um, I'm, I'm sure we're also familiar with the question where they say, well, do I have to cite this or not? I mean, is this something that I have to cite or is this just like common knowledge, right? And so it has a small discussion in chapter 40, uh, 40C, about what needs citation, what doesn't. And it's brief, but it's, it's, it's useful and usable. And again, I think what Alice was talk, talking about provides a shared language that we're using in these classes um, that uh, we can all be using so that they have a sense of, oh, yeah, this is, I've, I've talked about this before. I've worked on this. Um, finally, there's several points of reference that directly discuss plagiarism itself, how to avoid it. Um, there's a discussion in the AU-specific pages uh, back in Chapter E, so that front matter um, that's all AU-specific. There's a, a, bit of, a bit of a discussion about the Ac Academic Integrity Code, right? Um, there's also then a short section that discusses unintentional and deliberate plagiarism back in Chapter 40. Um, Again, you can remind students that they've been told very explicitly things like, and I'm actually going to quote something from chapter 40D here because I like it. <laughs> uh, deliberate plagiarism is also fairly simple to spot. Your instructor will be well acquainted with your writing and likely to notice any sudden shifts in style or quality of your work. Uh, in addition, by typing, a few or by typing a few words from a project into a search engine, your instructor can identify matches very easily. You know, they, sometimes they need to actually be told, if you could find it that easily, we can find it that easily, right? But it's, it's, it's useful. Um, finally, the text really does empower them to take responsibility for their research and for acknowledging sources. Um, again, in college writing, we've been part of those lessons, but you know, it, it doesn't hurt to be reminded of that on their part. Um, and you can use this text to remind them that they have that, that foundation to work from. I'll turn it over to you. All right, um, so I'm gonna pick up and talk about citations. Um, I'm sure we all, when we're working with students, oh, here, let me. When we're working with students and citations, we have a lot of students who don't know what MLA, APA, Chicago Style, or CSE are. And we don't need to know what they all are either, in fact. <laughs> I don't know what they all are. Um, I, am, I use MLA in my classes, and a lot of students will come to me and say, well, I'm never going to use MLA. Why do I need to know it? And so one of the conversations we have with them is about understanding this, ac this academic discipline. What are the rules that you need to be following in this new environment that you're in? So if you are in a class where you have to use APA, you need to learn how to do that. If you're in a class that uses CSE, you need to learn that. So we spend a lot of time talking about citations and how to go about doing that for them. One of the things that I love about this book is that you don't have to know how to do them. They have to figure out how to open up this book and figure out how to do them themselves. Um, all four of the common ones, um, MLA, APA, Chicago Style, and CSE, are covered in here. 
And if you want to take a look, I'm just going to walk you through very quickly the um, MLA section, just so you can get an idea of what every section has. So it starts on page 206, um, where it actually gives you the instructions on how the manuscript is actually supposed to look, what look like, what does your paper look like. Um, when I was in 10th grade, I had an English teacher, Mrs. Potter. I hated Mrs. Potter. Um, she had all of these rules. We could not write in brown pen. Um, we had to have our name in the right spot and then the date, or no, sorry, then the course number and then the date. And if we ever inverted them, she took off two points. And I thought that she was the most annoying teacher that I had ever had. But I actually do that now. Um, I don't take off points, but what I have come to discover is, and I don't think students realize how true it is, that if you have a pile of, when we're grading, we're usually grading 50 to 60 papers. When you have a pile of that many papers and yours doesn't follow the format, we read it differently. Um, so the conversation I've been having with my students is that you have the guidelines in here that tells you exactly what your paper needs to look like. If you can follow those guidelines, your paper will be read differently and the way that you actually want it to be read. So I know it seems like sort of a nitpicky thing, but it's made a huge difference. They have, each of the styles have their own format. It doesn't matter if you're using the same style that the entire department is using. Use whatever style you like to use. And then what you'll find is you will find you're reading papers differently. Um, you'll come to each essay with a little bit of a different focus. Um, so that's usually in the A section. Um, then. It explains how to do in-text citations. Um, a lot of students really struggle with what an in-text citation actually is, how to do it, what it looks like. So if you look on page, starting on page 207, MLA has a lot of rules for in-text citation. Um, so you'll see it goes on and it gives you all of these examples. For instance, if you have an indirect source, so if you have an author who is quoting someone else, if you look on page 211, number 15, you can figure out how to do that correctly. Okay, so the student just needs this. All you have to do is hand this to them. They can look through and they can find the scenario that they need. Um, the other thing it has is work cited. I have not yet been completely stumped um, by a student. I can figure out how to cite just about anything with this book. That means they can figure it out too. Um, and then the other thing that I like to point out to my students is their sample for each of the four styles. So on page 246 is the MLA sample. And I sort of point that out to students saying, that's what your paper should look like. That's what a paper following MLA guidelines in the academic discipline, that's what it looks like, match that, okay? Um, one thing I really like that this book has is source maps. The source maps are super helpful in terms of if you have a source, and this will happen a lot of times, a student will come to you and say, I don't know what this is, I don't know how to categorize it, how do I, what do I do, how do I get this into a proper format? So look on page 230. And you'll see that it defines for you, generally in MLA style, this is what you do if you have an article that's from a database. So you may have pieces of information that you can sort of figure out, and figure out, sort of cut and paste and figure out where they all go and sort of play with it like a puzzle. It does the same thing, you have the same format um, in all four styles with a variety of, site, of um, articles and, or excuse me, a variety of formats. Really, really helpful, okay? So, now we're gonna make you work. So, let's go ahead to, all right. So what you need to do, I'm gonna, I want you guys to work together. You'll need a piece of paper for this. Using two citation styles that you don't normally use. So if you use APA, I want you to try MLA. I want you to figure out how to reference this book. Go. <laughs> work with a partner. Figure out how to use this. This is what you're asking your students to do. You need to be able to do it too. What are you normally working with? Two. Yeah, I think you do. That would be eight. No. When I use a little bit of them online. Yeah. 
Should we start doing it now? Should they need help? Okay. Let's. Okay. So the question is, how do we do this? All this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ding, ding, ding. That's the bell. All right. You guys may not have finished, but that's okay. We're just going to come back. How'd you do? One of the questions that I get a lot from my students when we do similar things to this is, I don't need to know this. I actually, I'm just going to use the library because the library, if you go on the um, 
the database, it will, you can actually get the citation from there, or the students use NoodleBib or all of those various citation machines. And what I found is they don't know how to read citations, and so they don't know that there's a lot of mistakes in those and that they actually need to take the time to understand it. So here are the answers. You can check to see how well you did. You all get A's. <laughs> you all get gold stars for today. Um, I did these, and I actually, I, we were just talking about it up here. Most of us had never done the um, CSE before, so that was kind of confusing for me. Um, but the beauty of this book is that this will work for every single class because all of the classes here are going to use at least one of these citations. The other, the other thing that I found was really interesting is that the information, it's all the same. It's just basically how we put it in there. So that could be an interesting discussion you could have with your classes as well. What do we value? Why do th certain things come in certain places? I yeah. Have a really quick question. Um, so would you put in like information on addition? You don't put that in with APA, Chicago, and CSE style? You should, actually. I might have made a mistake. <laughs> Teachers make That's mistakes. That's probably what it is. Uh, <laughs> we make mistakes, and you should look yeah, it up in your handbook. Yep. <laughs> that would be, yes. It would be right after the easy pocket. That was a yes. trick. Nice job. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Angela? All right. Oh, here. Um, that's right. It's the microphone. I, I want to add also that if um, my student doesn't have, if they didn't bring this to class when we do a lot of these activities, again, every single thing that's in here, everything that Stina just showed you, is free and open on the Companion website. And it doesn't cost anything to get onto the, to the bed for URL. It's free and open. So if they're at the library and they didn't bring their handbook, um, they can simply look it up on their own. They don't have to have the handbook with them. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> she wants to check herself. <laughs> I saw, I saw comma AA for APA. It should be the initial. It should be the initial, not the full name for APA. See, I don't do APA. And when you, when you talk about, and then when you talk about values and things, it has to do, okay, is it a gender thing? Is it a... Mm -hmm. We're tricking you. <laughs> just checking. All right, shall we go on? Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, I will just sort of say next okay. because I have a bunch of actions in the slides. Okay. 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 All right. About halfway through the Easy Writer book, uh, halfway through the book, Easy Writer gives an example of a college English teacher who's um, describing her experiences when she changed from her education system in China to coming to the U.S. And um, in China, she was a, a good student and actually a very good writer in both Chinese and English, but she knows in the U.S., while she could easily use grammar books and dictionaries, her instructor's unstated expectations seemed to call for her to write in a way that was new to her. And this brings me to my first point as to how Easy Writer can help multilingual writers. And it makes many of these unstated expectations explicit. Um, for example, in terms of general expectations of academic writing, there's a checklist at the end of chapter one that gives notes about things like explicit claims, explicit thesis statements, and documenting your sources. And for each of these topics, it actually has references other places. Um, 1A, page 13, um, it actually references the other chapters in the book where they could see more about that, or you could refer students to more about that. Um, even when we state these expectations um, and we tell students, okay, do this or do that, uh, in this book, the students can actually read and see them and have the time to go at their own pace and go back to the points as they need to. Having input from multiple modalities in this way, both oral and visual, and having that time component is important for all learning, but it's especially important to language development as well. Um, anyhow, I've listed here a few more um, places that I, I personally have found very helpful in working with my multilingual students in the first semester in terms of paragraphing, in terms of creating thesis with an argument. In fact, the three criteria of arguable statements has a little marker with a heart on it for me. Um, I go back to that part a lot. And organizing. 
Um, I also frequently use examples, such as the annotated paper examples that Stina had mentioned at the end of the, um, uh, the citation formats and the source maps. Um, so students can actually see what I'm talking about as I'm, as I'm referring to it. Everything my colleagues have mentioned today throughout the book help in this endeavor of making our expectations ex more explicit, which especially helps students coming from other educational, um, uh, other educational styles and other languages. Um, beyond the general advice here, the book also has explicit advice for analyzing assignments in different disciplines and in different genres there. So as I mentioned, chapter five talks about the different disciplines and um, the 36, uh, 33B actually talks about, okay, if you're looking at a, a memo versus something else, how do you analyze a different genre of writing? Thanks. Um, Easy Writer also has features that target multilingual writers specifically. For example, um, let me go to the next. Chapter 33 to 37 come in a section called Multilingual Writers, specifically. This section starts out um, with advice about analyzing academic genres and learning language features associated with those genres. Then the section has chapters on articles, prepositions, um, and other troublesome topics for multilingual learners that um, have not actually appeared in the uh, top 20 um, that Melissa had mentioned. Let me give you a caveat on these prepositions article section. Telling a student, okay, we'll read that chapter in the book is not going to fix those mistakes. Um, the chapters and online exercises associated with, say, prepositions and articles can serve as a baseline for some of the rules. For example, um, one of the advice, pieces of advice it gives is the preposition on is usually used with horizontal surfaces. Um, but going a step further, the type of language analysis outlined in 33B uh, builds on that base by providing a way to look at structures used in an academic genre. For example, they give a part of an abstract from a social science paper and different parts are highlighted on, in that. And you can see a phrase such as, based on the research of. Now that's a language chunk. That instead of trying to apply the on rule to different things, doing this kind of language analysis based on the research of, they can use that phrase in their own writing in different places. Um, and after they try it in their own writing, they'll get feedback from all of us and eventually come to be more facile with them. So. Um, in terms of language development, this is a really good start for some of those areas like prepositions and articles, and then doing the language analysis, they, when they do the language analysis and try it in their own writing and get feedback. That whole cycle gets to some of these learning acquisition areas. Um, okay. Outside of those chapters, go ahead, Mike. Um, there are call-out boxes throughout the book um, for multilingual writers. For example, at the end of one of the chapters Mike talked about, about avoiding plagiarism, there's a call out box that says for multilingual writers that says thinking about plagiarism as a cultural concept. So these are throughout the book and I find them useful not only for the students but also for me as an instructor because they, for me they serve as a quick reminder of particular areas that may cause some trouble for some of my multilingual writers and why they might cause that trouble. So good for the students, good for me to remember too. And then finally, in the customized pages at the beginning, um, there is uh, a place with AU-specific resources for multilingual writers. This is in section H called um, for international students, resources. And there we have uh, sources like the Writing Lab, International Student Scholar Services, Academic Support and Access Center. It gives a quick description of uh, what a student might get there and contact information for that place. So in terms of multilingual writers, I find this book particularly useful as a source that makes some of our unstated expectations explicit, um, a source of common language to talk about when, in writing and research, and as an additional visual resource for students to support my written topics, um, uh, written assignments and, and verbal explanations. The book also highlights for me and my multilingual writers topics that are particularly important for these students. Thank you. Um, the final thing that, would you go to the next slide, Mark? I'm sorry. This one? Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. Sorry. 
Um, the final thing that we want to emphasize is that if you chose to come to this session at Anfarin, and really it's the last session of the day, right? We're all ready to leave, and you came. Um, I'm guessing that you have writing assignments in your own classrooms, and I'm guessing that you value writing, and that you would agree that we all teach college writing. It can't be something that's specific that the freshmen do first semester in the college writing program, and then they forget about for the, for the remaining three and a half years that, that they're at AU. Um, but oftentimes we find that the things that they learn first semester or even second semester aren't translating quite as well into their other classrooms. Um, the research I've looked at looks at students who are in a literature program and in a, another class and how the papers differ. And it really has to do with what we value, whether or not they're translating those skills that we know that we have taught them to their other classrooms, right? And if they don't consider classes outside the literature program, writing classes also, they aren't going to emphasize those skills the same way. So part of it is that we all teach college writing and we wanted to share this resource with you so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel, so that you know what it is that our freshmen, uh, that any of the students in our college writing program are being taught so that you can help emphasize it also and hold them accountable for it also. Um, this is a resource that our students already have and our goal is to help create a common language among the university but also among all of our classes. We struggle to do this even within the college writing program. One of the ways that we create a common language is we have a common rubric that every single writing faculty in the college writing program uses on every single essay that is written in our program. So it's in our book, but Mike, do you want to pass out that sure, version sure. of it? Um, if you turn to AU uh, in the beginning of the book, AU, I think it's six. Yes, AU six, those are the learning outcomes. Um, AU eight is the actual grading criteria that we as a faculty have developed in order to make sure that we're using a common language when we talk about writing, but also a common grading criteria to hold them accountable so that those skills are transferable between our classrooms. Okay. Um, this is a rubric that we use, um, like I said, for each research essay within our program. It's also a useful thing, not just for grading, but it also helps us communicate to them what we mean when we say excellent writing because we may mean something different. Yes? So you share it with us. I, we share that with them. That's on my Blackboard site. It's attached to the syllabus. It's attached to every essay that I return to them that has a grade on it. Um, many of our colleagues actually modify it. They make the boxes larger because there's an electronic version of it, of course. They make the boxes larger so they can add comments as they go. This is simply the, the standard that the college writing program uses, but many people adapt it also. And it is free to you. If you're interested in using a rubric in your classrooms or um, you want to simply be consistent and, and emphasize the way that students have been taught to write well. Yes? Is this particular uh, matrix available? It can be if you sign that sheet. Um, it is actually so on our, website. yeah, it's actually on our website. That's, That's correct. Yeah, it is on our website. <laughs> the grid, it, this grid itself might not, it might not be in that format. That like mm -hmm. the way it is in this book is kind of annoying if you're going to make use of it. Like mm -hmm. some of our faculty uses it, actually will put it with a student essay and highlight parts of it yep. that apply to that essay so the student mm -hmm. can see not only the specifics but also sort of why they got the grade they got. So if you want this format, um, I would say get in touch with us by email. Mm -hmm. If you sign the sign-up sheet and have an email on there, I'd be happy to send that out also. With all the links um, to, the, to the companion website, they're easy things for you to find also, but sometimes it's easier just to click on a link uh, to find those things too. Um, so we're hoping to create a common language and we're hoping to share with you the resources that we've developed in case you want to use them in your own classroom or adapt them to your own classroom, but just simply to know what it is that your students are being taught. Um, we're hoping that you go forward and share the, the Easy Writer, um, the companion website. And if you're looking for um, an additional online resource, we recommend, that's a hyperlink, we recommend what's called the OWL. Have any, have any of you heard of the OWL? Yeah, it's the online writing program. It, it is the standard among universities. It's out of Purdue University. Um, and this is a hyperlink that, that is always on my Blackboard site that, that the College Writing Center recommends also to our students who are looking for a, simply a companion website. It's an additional resource. The reason I recommend it to my students is because I know it's reliable and there are many MLA websites out there that are not actually MLA or you know a very well-intentioned yeah. teacher put up a version of it and now it's an outdated version and I know that this version is, is not only updated but it's reliable. 
I know someone who worked for for the owl, and they actually called APA on one of their. They've come out with the public an updated publication manual, and the Purdue owl called them and said, "Um, you made a mistake." <laughs> and APA changed it. <laughs> she said, "Never doubt the owl." Um, the grading grid in that format is available online as a PDF. It is. We just checked. So if you if you Google College Writing Program American University, um, you'll see grading criteria, and you can click there. And what I like about the owl, um, in the same way of, of of the Easy Writer, is that they have visuals when they say this is what MLA format. Mm -hmm looks like. Mm -hmm. They'll have a list of all the rules, but then they have a paper that shows you actually what it looks like. And I think that's really important for all of our students, um, especially for multilingual students, that, that the actual text might get lost in translation, but that's a visual. Yeah. And so that supports mm -hmm. that what I'm saying I'm actually showing you also, mm -hmm. which is just a good teaching tool. Mm -hmm. um, and then in conclusion, we think that um, we just want to thank you for coming. Open it up to questions. We know that uh, you value writing too or you wouldn't have come on this dreary Friday afternoon uh, when you probably are supposed to be somewhere fixing a syllabus or getting it ready. For <laughs> yeah. Karan, go ahead. I've been uh, attending different sessions this morning and hearing some of my colleagues in other mm -hmm. departments with that common frustration. I don't have time to teach writing and I think mm -hmm. part of that is I don't know how to teach writing. So I think this is really wonderful, but I'm wondering if we all could also just give people another two or three ideas out the door, um, how to bridge that I'm not teaching, but I'm expecting and I'm supporting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one thing you were talking about common language, I was thinking, that would be interesting if I teach political science to say, if you're gonna have to write a persuasive paper, what do you know, what have you learned about what goes into that? Mm -hmm. I just kind of do some norming. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't know, would that be interesting to see if Students use language like a thesis statement or sources or counter argument. And then I defer to my very esteemed, knowledgeable comrades. Especially in the second one in 101, I'll do that. Okay. Here's the research paper assignment. What do you guys know about a research paper already? Right. And so that gets them activate. I think, I think of it as learning, activating background knowledge. And that's how I usually take it. Well, it could be useful. I was thinking about this as I was structuring my class mm -hmm. for the spring as well. It might be useful for a faculty member to think about what you're expecting them to know before, before giving them an assignment. So then you can tell them what you expect them to know. So then they can be like, ooh, I actually don't know that. I'm going to need to deal with that. So if I tell my students, like, I expect when you're here, if you're here right now, that you know uh, what information literacy means, or that you know how to find an article on the library's database and cite mm -hmm. it correctly. Mm -hmm. And then if I have a student that doesn't feel comfortable with that, they either come in to talk to me or I can refer them to things like this. And so maybe even a section on an assignment sheet that says something like, here are the skills that I expect you to know, or the things I expect you to know, or the skills that I expect you to have to be able to do this assignment. So then at least they can kind of check in and say, Ugh, I need to get a little bit more comfortable with that before I can move on. I don't know, just mm -hmm. an idea that. One of the, the conversations about writing that I've heard today um, is about how much time it takes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that there isn't really a quick, easy way for me to do this. Um, in the last session, they spoke more about concise papers, the value of, of maybe a one to two page paper rather than we think the 15 page mark is what we're supposed to be doing but perhaps it's easier for professors and for students to work in smaller chunks and teach these skills as they go. When I take home uh, 60 research papers that are 15 plus pages, um, I hate them too. And, and I love this job and I hate them. Um, and so one of the things that, that I've done differently in my own teaching is rather than try to have students do three or four large assignments, I have them produce one publishable quality paper by the end of the semester that they could honestly submit to an undergraduate. And I have my students submit to undergraduate research journals. Um, and that means that I am focused on a concept, an idea, a draft with them for the semester. And so I'm walking them through that process. I start by teaching them, how do you write a research question? Rather than the draft is due October 10th, where they have no idea what to do between August and October 10th. 
How do we write a research question? That's a really small skill, and it's manageable for me to read 56 research questions, right? I can do that, and I can tell you if it's a good one or a bad one before we move forward. So I think by breaking it up into chunks, it's more manageable in the teaching, but it's also more manageable for our students. And they don't really know how to do when, when we say, well, just start with the question, then get a one-page draft, and then get a draft. I think that that concept um, is well-intentioned, of course, but I, I don't know that our students actually know how to do that. So I hold them accountable to the research question first, long before the paper. I actually forbid them to write the paper. You are not allowed to write the paper until November. Then I bring in a librarian and we talk about research. Then we find all of our sources and we actually go out and find out what the conversation is about the topic rather than start with a thesis. Um, we actually start with a question. Um, so by breaking it up that way, I think it becomes a little bit more manageable. And then I'm not looking at 56, 15 plus page drafts and hating every minute of every day. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I don't know whose hand is up first. Yeah. Just shout it out. Um, okay. um, I, was, I was wondering, it sounds like they're taught, obviously, how to search on the library databases for research, mm -hmm. et cetera. Are they taught at all in these classes on just kind of the basic framework of what a scholarly primary research study looks like and how to read it? Because I have a lot of trouble with students who, you know, they go do the research, they pull up primary studies. My assumption is that they just can't digest it, and then I get papers that's basically all direct quotes mm -hmm. with a little bit of their words. For the direct research, the writing spaces article? Oh, yeah. That's what I was going to recommend. Yeah, the, the, the Rosenberg. The, the, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I had mentioned yes, one article great. from uh, a site called writingspaces.org. Um, it's .org, right, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that was Kyle Stedman earlier. There's another one that's actually becoming very popular with, uh, amongst us that's uh, by Karen Rosenberg called uh, Reading Games, and it's about how do you approach and how do you read scholarly literature. Right, uh, scholarly articles, primary sources, so forth. Especially um, like those research study articles. Right, exactly, especially great. like those. And, and kind of walks them through the steps. Yeah, it's called Reading Games by Rosenberg. Um, and it's, it's fantastic because it tells them, hey, look at the title. Read the abstract, right? right. Um, but then don't just start and plunge in and read the entire article. You know, read the introduction, read the conclusion, look at the organization mm -hmm. of this. What do the, the headings tell you? It does things like that. And that's, that's been very useful in my class for them to be able to at least start to kind of pick apart and understand mm -hmm. at least the parts that they need. Because the other thing that, that they discover from that is they don't need to digest the entire article. They may just want the, the results or the conclusions based on that mm -hmm. or something else there. Uh, they may need the whole thing, but they have to decide that, and that's part of that, that process. Yeah. So. I can also add, too, that at the library, uh, this issue of reading, I think, I'm not sure mm -hmm. if everybody has sort of felt this way or if this is me or in the program, but uh, reading is a huge issue that's discussed mm -hmm. in composition scholarship right now more than it has been in the past 10 years or so um, as a huge issue that students of this particular generation are facing more than any other um, and that and that is a, a, a result of both the sort of online world where a lot of reading happens um, but also this kind of pressure to multitask to be efficient to do things quickly and we all know that you can't read a scholarly article quickly just like you can't write a good essay quickly. Um, and so uh, lots, of, lots of problems that are associated with it. But at the library, in, in our classes, certainly we do work on reading skills and, and that component of information literacy skills that deals with, is this a scholarly article? How do I know? How do I read it? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that can't get a, a huge chunk of time in every single class. Um, and so these reference sources might be helpful for students to check out on their own. Projects that involve things like annotated bibliographies or any opportunity where students have to talk about a source on its own without having to in have it interact is a good way to start building that where they have to be able to talk about this one thing before they put it in conversation with something else uh, have been described in research and practice as effective ways to kind of move them a little further along to where they need to be in terms of reading. But I think what you're noticing is definitely really common right now. Yeah, it's a good point what you make about the um, annotated bibliography. I was thinking of doing that too, because the other thing, of course, is mm -hmm. if they wait too long, mm -hmm. they right. realize mm -hmm. that they can't digest right. the scholarly right. article that quickly right. in the right. textbook. Mm -hmm. so. right. in, mm -hmm. in my annotated bibliographies, the students will wrestle with between 10 and 15 sources, mm -hmm. but I forbid them from using that many in the final paper. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be able to use that many well. 
So part of it is also identifying, this is the whole conversation that's happening in popular sources and in scholarly sources about GMOs. This is the conversation. Um, and without reading all of them, deciding which of them would be most useful in their conversation. And then reading those three scholarly articles well and integrating those into their argument rather than trying to cover 15 mm -hmm. or just ooh, that needs to match the more excited page and therefore I've done more is better. I would much rather them wrestle with three scholarly articles well. But I do think we have to teach them how to read scholarly articles. Mm -hmm. And I teach them that when they're doing the annotated bibliography, you don't actually read them all. In graduate school, I didn't read them all. <laughs> mm -hmm. I figured out which ones I needed to read. Mm -hmm. And the way we do that is by reading better, not more, right? I, I, read, I will read the abstract and then I will make a quick decision whether or not I want to read more. And I know that seems really obvious, but I don't know that our students always have that obvious skill. And I think that's something we have to teach them. We value popular sources a great deal in our writing classes also. I think it's really artificial to pretend that the only conversation that's happening uh, with, is within the academy. Um, and sometimes those sources are, are, are uh, nice gateways to the scholarly source, foundational things that they may have put away the scholarly source if they hadn't had the popular source explain it. Um, quick comment and a question. The comment is, um, I joined the faculty four years ago, and the first time I taught a class with undergrads I would have to write was, at, was in the third year. And when I put in uh, my syllabus, I quickly got a notice that I had to add that this is a general education course, and these are the expectations you have to put in, um, and this is the language you need to put in about the writing center. I had already mentioned the Writing Center, but I didn't know what the language was. So anyway, so I put that all in. Um, there's been no further explanation, though, for me, of what the Writing Center does or what the college writing class is. Mm -hmm. And after this session, um, I see ways that I would very, very differently handle the writing assignments mm -hmm. in the classes that I'm teaching to undergrads who are going through this experience. And so the comment is that I think it's important, maybe it's just um, the School of Public Affairs, that whoever is in charge of assigning faculty to gen ed courses make sure that that faculty knows that you guys are doing this because that disconnect is really exactly. unfortunate. Yeah, right? it's, it's not I beneficial mean, to our students. It wastes a lot of my time yeah. and makes yeah. the big yeah. investment of my time less effective. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the comment. Um, and certainly I'm happy to say that in SPA or mm -hmm. elsewhere for that matter. Um, the other thing is a question based on what Angela presented and about the um, writing for non-native speakers. And this isn't about my students, but um, I run a center that has about 20 fellows from um, often not the United States who are here in effect with faculty appointments mm -hmm. for periods of time. And when they're not writing in English, this isn't a problem. But when they're writing in English, we have a lot of the sorts of problems that this tool, um, what, this tool and OWL address. Um, can those people with essentially faculty appointments access this stuff through the uh, library, through the website? You can access anywhere. it anywhere. Everything we've shown you is free and open. Um, Excellent. Mm -hmm. They can access it anywhere. And, and I would certainly agree. I think that's a common frustration in the college writing program, mm -hmm. that we want to share these resources. Mm -hmm. And perhaps we're not doing a good enough job sharing them. Perhaps we're not marketing ourselves well enough. What we know now is, since we've switched to this version of it, yeah. and we've been working at spreading the word campus-wide, every one of our deans now has, everybody in the college writing program, we're hoping it starts trickling down, but until we'll go directly to people. Every yeah. dean's office, mm -hmm. if they have undergrads in their program, needs mm -hmm. to tell the faculty who's teaching those classes this. Mm -hmm. right? we, we couldn't here, agree here. more. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I really like my Spread job. the word. We're, <laughs> we're right? spreading the word. You, you guys, guys spread CCS? the word. Uh, yeah. We are. Yes. We're in the college so of and he has the book. But this is a brand new book, too. So this is a new push for our program. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there like an insert in the syllabus that you recommend to promote the book? Because sometimes, like, I have taught in the first semester. Mm -hmm. And I guess probably, not necessarily students are taking this class, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I can tell by the way they write. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I mean, they get much better in the third year. But, right. uh, so if I don't know what to refer them to, some 
are, do you have any recommendations? Who, these four lines. That's a you great see. idea. No, that's we don't. Idea. But that's a fantastic so idea. We even have the emergency preparedness mm -hmm. paragraph. Mm -hmm. to put. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We certainly could construct that language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a great idea. We'll do that. And I hope it'll get to you if your name is on that list, but I'm afraid that's the only power we have. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Karan. Do you mind if I put in a quick update about the working group? Mm -hmm. We don't mind. Go that's ahead. That's about to be a task force. And Lynn Stallings was here mm -hmm. at the beginning of the session and had to go to another session, which is at the highest level, we're recognizing that the left hand is not talking to the right, and students are the casualty in the middle. Mm -hmm. and, and not the faculty who were putting mm -hmm. and faculty as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were at a, at a panel discussion where we saw the writing tip sheet that the SOTC professor put together and the one that the co-god went, and we're all in reinventing the wheel endlessly. Mm -hmm. So we understand that's an issue. What we love to hear is from the ground up faculty saying, we need this. Mm -hmm. Because there is a sense of we don't want to be told what to do. We are political scientists mm -hmm. or we're historians mm -hmm. and this isn't what we do. The students should come to us knowing this. If we can have the kind of exactly what you said, collaboration, had I known, I would have crafted uh, mm -hmm. assignments differently, mm -hmm. building on what our students know. It's exactly the spirit that administrators have to hear and make that successful. Mm -hmm. And one other thing, um, just a quick logistics. Mike, can you go to the writing spaces um, uh, yeah, site, absolutely. Just here so people sure. can see where that is. With the meeting, we've talked now about the Stedman, <laughs> right. Mike Bunge, how to read like a writer is there. Mm -hmm. right. Uh, annoying ways students use sources. It's, it's right. a terrific free resource. Right, so this is a, an open source textbook, essentially, yeah. is, is what it is. It's in two volumes now. I think they're working on a, a third, yeah. right? Um, and actually, where I always go to is I actually, uh, you can read about it here. I go to the downloads. Um, and this will give you then a list of all these different articles on. Um, Ryan Technologies, there's the Annoying Ways People Use Sources. Um, I don't know other ones that, that others use here. Um, I know I use... I do a lot with close reading on Okay, here I've I used... Oh, so I was going to say I've used Randall McClure's uh, Googlepedia, which is all about kind of research and turning information, literacy behaviors they already have into research skills. Um, and so there's, there's a number of them here. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's the Mike Bunn's How to Read Like a Writer, uh, which I know a lot of us often start off mm -hmm. early in the semester with. Uh, in our classes, so yeah, so there's that. <laughs> Other questions or concerns? Okay, thank you very much for coming, and we'll hang out if you have questions. Thank you.